This video will be a brief introduction to plotting in R. Uh, first, we're going to need to read in some data. So I'm going to be using that same serial.csv data set from last time. I'm going to load in a ser uh, save it as data frame named serial. I'm going to use it read.csv function. And again, I'm in this working directory. I can see it's right here. So this I know this will work. Okay, now I have serial CSV. I'm going to use the head function we looked at in the data frame video to um, get a brief overview of what we have again. So we have this first thing, X, calories, protein, fat, sodium, fiber, carbohydrates, sugar, potassium. So we have a lot of numerics, one character variable. And once again, what I want to do is change the first uh, column name, that X, I just want to change that to brand so it kind of follows the same format as the rest of them and it's a little more descriptive. So by doing this, if we print the first six rows of serial again, I can now see that the first column has been renamed brand. So this is a very clean data from now and we can get started with some plots. So first, uh, the first function we're going to use is box plot. I'm sure you've seen plenty of box plots before. Uh, let's just see what happens uh, without passing any special arguments. Let's follow this method down here where we pass just an X, which is our data frame. So th there's other um, ways you can use this box plot function, specifically by giving some kind of formula. We're going to just focus on giving the, the data frame. So we're just going to do a box plot of serial. And what we can see here is that we have um, we now have on our x-axis each of our column names, our, our variable names, and uh, on the left-hand side we get the relative counts for each. So one thing I'm I'm noticing right off the bat is uh, it's a little hard to interpret this, uh, at least with this window size, because you have some of these box plots that are so small, and then you have others that are big. And what's happening here with the brand? You may be wondering why a categorical can have a box plot. Uh, it, this is basically, since there are um, 43 unique serial names, they're kind of converted, Boxplot will kind of convert them to 1 through 43, so the max here is going to be 43. Um, so this column is completely useless, so we're going to split this into two separate data frames. Um, one for calories, sodium, and potassium, and then one for protein, fat, fiber, carbohydrates, and sugar. Uh, carbohydrates got cut off here because it's a pretty long name, but if I were to stretch it out like that, it'll show up again. Okay, one trick that we can use originally is um, just for the sake of plotting, we're going to make a temporary data frame. I'm just going to name this DF for data frame, and uh, I just want to cut out the brand name for, just for now. Um, so what I'm going to do is a special trick with indexing, pretty specific case where if you want to exclude one specific column, um, this would also work if you want to do a row, but anyway, we're, we're looking at a column here. I want all the rows, so I'm doing a blank and then a comma, and I'm going to do negative one. So if I did one, it'll give me just that brand column, but by doing this, I'm creating a new data frame um, just for these numeric plots that doesn't have the brand name in the front. So if I did box plot of this DF now, well, we still have the same issue, but at least this time uh, we don't have to worry about something that's kind of meaningless. That first box plot for the brand name was meaningless. Uh, these are all numeric, so these make sense. So now we just need to split into kind of one and two. So DF, DF1, we're going to take from data frame, we're going to use kind of the, um, since we have multiple, we can't just do the dollar sign. We're going to need to make a vector with the different column names. So we want calories, we want sodium, and we want potassium. So now if I do box plot of this new data frame, oops. now we everything's on the same scale, so we can reasonably interpret these plots. So um, sodium has crazy outlier here, it looks to be zero. Um, overall, somewhat, um, it's much higher than the other two on average. Calories has kind of a weird thing going in here, plenty of outliers. Um, the middle 
the 25th to 75th percentile, it, it's a pretty small um, interquartile range or IQR um, as compared to the rest of these. Um, and again, this one has outliers on the top and the bottom. So for the most part, the calories are kind of clustered together right around 100. It could just be a reporting kind of thing. Uh, with potassium, seem to tend lower, but there are a few high outliers. Sodium is the opposite. Okay, now let's take a look at the, we want to make box plots on a different scale for the rest of these. So we're going to define DF2. This could be a little bit longer of a indexing call, but we're going to need protein, fat, fiber, carbohydrates, and sugar. So now if we take the box plot of this, now we're on the same scale. The max is 20 instead of close to 200. So uh, we can actually see the spread of these now. So fat peaks at, at four, it looks like. Protein has an outlier at five and six, but it's mostly somewhat low. So we get, we get a couple different shapes here. Fiber and protein are kind of skewed towards a higher, um, despite their meaning being lower. Sugar um, and carbohydrates are in general in higher counts than the first three. But they're, they're close enough, so I don't think we need to make separate box plots for these three. So a uh, pretty simple method just for getting the box plots. Now let's say if we want a histogram, function is called hist, H-I-S-T. So there's a couple arguments that you may end up uh, needing to look at at some point. So we'll kind of go through them briefly. X is going to be the vector of values for our histogram. So what that's going to tell us, it's specifically a vector. So we, were, we will not be able to pass it an entire data frame. It'll have to be one single column at a time, uh, which makes sense with how histograms work. For breaks, uh, this is something you won't need always need to mess with, but if you want to customize how thin or how wide your bins are, this is how you can do it. So, um, for example, we know with fiber, it uh, you kind of see here, I see 1.520, 1.5. So we'd want bins maybe at every from zero, like every 0 0.5 is an interval, or you may, you may want to simplify it and just have a bin from zero to one, one to two, and so on. So if you want customization, you would use it for breaks, but again, but with this function, like with the box plot, you could just pass it the vector you want, and it'll, it'll, it'll give you something without having to find these. You may want to customize these at some point, though. Um, this freak or freq argument uh, will change the, basically, it'll just change the label for the y-axis, and so we can take a look at an example of that. So first, let's say I, I want to pick one of the higher um, variance variables, so one of the ones from uh, df1, so I'm going to say df1 dollar calories. It'd be the same if I did df dollar calories or serial dollar calories, um, they'd, they'd all be the same. So here we see that this is a frequency, so these are the number of times each of these shows up. So 25 times you have something between 100 and 120. Uh, I'm guessing it's 100 inclusive in here on the left, um, from the left side on, and 80 to 100, a little more than 10, and that's where most of the calorie counts are. We, we saw the same sort of thing with the box plots. Most of them are, are within this range, 100 to 120. Now, let's just see what happens if we were to change this to so histogram, same column, calories, but we're going to do freak equals false because the default is true, and now this is density. So, um, if you see the, the shape is going to be the same between these two, this will just, if you're asked to have the density on the y-axis, you just change this one um, parameter frequency. And that should cover most of what you need for this function. We can take a look at a few more histograms. Uh, for one of the smaller ones, let's try sugar. Here we go. This one is, is not really following any kind of, um, it's not really a normal pattern at all. It's It seems to be bimodal. Um, so that's, that's a pretty interesting one. I'm going to check out one of the other high variance ones, say sodium. So DF1 dollar sodium. And this is a little more normal looking. It's a little bit skewed, but um, not too bad. And since we only have 43 cer cereals, this is um, kind of a nice histogram. Okay, 
the next thing we're going to look at, this is going to be a lot to take in. I'm probably going to need to expand this plot window. So let me go ahead and do that. Make this as big as possible, uh, just so you're able to read it from the video. Um, the function I'm going to use is called pairs. And again, with this one, um, I want to leave off the brand name. So I'm actually going to use the DF. So remember, DF is just serial, but with that negative one index, it took out that first column, the brand column. This is exactly what we want. All of these need to be numeric for this to make sense. Okay, so there's a lot going on here. We can see uh, on our diagonal axis, our main diagonal, you have all of our variables and at each one we have different scatter plots. So one observation is that if you kind of look at, so calories and protein, calories and protein, these are identical scatter plots just flipped around. So way to tell, way we can tell which is which, I, I know that calories is pretty high and protein is pretty low. So your horizontal, so um, we can see that here calories is the y axis, here protein is the x axis, it's, it's the opposite way around. So if if you're looking at any given scatter plot, let's say I pick this one, I see fat is coming from the side, so I know it's going to be on my y axis, and I see carbohydrates on the bottom, so that's going to be my x axis. That's how this will work, and we see carbohydrates kind of here. That's uh, that seems to be right. Fat was a little bit lower, kind of in the zero to, to five or zero to four range, and so so that's how you can interpret these. Basically, we just mass produce these scatter plots all in one convenient format. It's nice you can look at some general patterns. Um, one thing that stands out to me immediately is that you can tell which variables only have a few possible values. So take a look at this fat column. Um, alter al alternatively, you can look at the fat row, but you see here at the column, um, fat only takes on four values. It seems to be zero, one, two, and three. And so uh, you have kind of a discrete looking plot. It's not really, th there's only so many values of fat. Um, I obviously, all of these take on a limited number of values, but with something like sodium, you have a lot more, so it looks like a continuous plot here. We just have four, so you're going to see these vertical patterns. Um, so fat is clearly like that. Um, fiber to a little bit of a lesser extent. Uh, definitely protein is also like that. So protein and fat are kind of discrete compared to everything else. Okay. Um, we have a, another function or two to cover before we just get into regular old plotting. Let me move this window back a little bit. So this next function is going to be the curve function. This is kind of handy if you need to manually draw something. So the first argument is going to be some kind of expression. So it's not super complicated. If you see this, this one example should c clear up what that means. So if I want to make a plot that shows just x squared, all I need to do is do curve and then um, x raised to the power of 2. So on my x-axis, I'm going to have x. That's kind of it reads in the x is what your it, it, it detects that I'm giving it x squared. And so it knows um, that's what I want the y-axis to be. And so it will show just x and the x-axis. So this is an uh, x and x squared plot from x equals 0 to x equals 1. We can also specify the range. So if I want to expand this a little bit, this can be from equals zero to equals 10. And let's just make sure this should be defining the x-axis. And indeed, we can see that now the y-axis goes from zero to 100 to match. So I can, the, the expressions can take on different forms. So um, we can also do just some kind of combination, x squared plus x plus three all kinds of different polynomials and there we go um, this is a pretty flexible function it's not uh, for it doesn't really have too much to do with dealing with real data it's it's really handy though if you want to make a plot that's kind of a comparison so later on with regression you may have some kind of fit and you want to add in a kind of curve to compare it so if you think this thing looks kind of like or if you think x squared sort of fits on the data, then you might plot x squared over a scatter plot of the data. So let's let's actually see what, um, later on in, uh, we can see a little bit what that looks like, how you can add lines to plots. So the next function we're gonna look at, it's a pretty powerful one, just the plot function. And so the first thing we're gonna do is just try plotting df. Think about what might happen here. 
and this looks this should look familiar this is our pairs plot so the plot function is pretty flexible it can detect what kind of input it's dealing with and return an appropriate plot so uh, you can get a, lo a lot of the plots that we've been dealing with you can get from the plot function itself another example if we do um, serial calories you can now just get an individual scatter plot from that pairs function. So, so pairs you can still use it, but um, if you just if you're just trying to get a scatter plot matrix, that's what that this last thing is called a scatter plot matrix. If you just want one of these, you can use pairs or plot. Um, another nice thing about plot is that it comes with a lot of different um, parameters that we can change. So, in this case, we either need a X coordinates that match with some Y coordinates or a single plotting structure such as a data frame or a vector. We here, let me go back to the plots window. Here we plotted from a data frame, here we plotted from a vector. Now we can also say uh, we can now combine an X and a Y. So let's plot calories against sugar. I want to avoid some of the more discrete ones. Um, uh, calories here is, is somewhat like that so it's actually instead say let's look back at that scatter plot matrix say sugar and sodium so this is going to put um, sugar on the x-axis and sodium on the y-axis because of the way I ordered this there we go so we just plotted sodium against sugar now um, there's a couple of quick changes that you can make the first and probably the most important is labeling this so we're going to take that same function from above um, the function call from above plotting sh sugar against sodium but let's make a descriptive title this time we're going to use a, uh, an argument called main equals you see i typed in and it'll show up here um, kind of telling us this is an acceptable argument to pass to the plot function and say main sodium versus sugar and immediately you'll see this bold title there um, there are ways to kind of tweak the uh, the size of the size and color of any of these titles I'll, I'll briefly mention how to find those those uh, techniques at the end now let's also add in some labels so on the bottom here this this kind of works because the data set is properly labeled so you can see serial dollar sugar but if I want to override that and give a new label, I need to xlab equals sugar. That'll replace that. And we're going to just keep adding on and just do the same thing for the y label. So we need this to just be sodium. That's a much better looking plot. Uh, this is well labeled. And so we're going to kind of build off of this plot now with a few more um, useful functions. So one thing is, this is more of a personal preference. You have this argument called PCH, which can change your dot size. One I, I always like to look at is basically it takes the same size dot and fills it in. Um, a lot of times this can be much more readable, especially if you're dealing with a lot of points. So um, we've added label, we've changed the X and Y labels and we've added a main title. Uh, we can also, if we choose, color some of the points just going to keep adding on to this function call so we're just going to have the same plot change the scatter plot uh, the the scatter points to blue uh, that covers most of the basics for these plots you shouldn't need too much more than this um, in the regression video and lecture notes we'll cover how to add in um, regression lines to these we need to be able to see regression lines first um, or see how to make a regression line first but once we get there we'll, we'll cover that um, the last thing we're going to do doesn't really have so much to do with the plot function but an, an additional function that will add on to this and that is called a b line so we're going to open up the documentation for this real quick so there's also there's four key things to look out for here you either want to pass an a and a b which is a, a being your intercept, B being your slope, they need to be single values, or you can pass an a, just an H by itself, which is the Y value for a horizontal line, V 
x value for a vertical line, h horizontal v vertical. So let's look at this last line. What I, the last thing I'm going to do here with this plot is add in some lines demonstrating the mean of sugar and the mean of sodium. So I want sugar to be a vertical line. So now what the AB line will do, or the AB line will do, is take your existing plot and add this line to it. So uh, we want, again, instead of vertical line, and we're going to do v. So we're going to we're going to need to specify v is mean of cereal dollar sugar. So now we've added this vertical line. This tells us um, exactly where the mean is for sugar. You can see how the points are distributed around the mean. And now, if we want to, st uh, just one note, we can also change the color of these if we so choose. Oh, I just made that red. Now. Let's just add a horizontal line for this um, for the sodium mean. So we need H this time equals mean serial dollar sodium. And one thing I should note, I could be using DF dollar sugar, DF dollar sodium. Um, it's a little redundant with all the different but very similar data frames. That was just kind of an exercise. Um, there we go. So let's make this one green. Um, I apologize if any of you are colorblind. This this is just kind of a demonstration that you can change the colors if you so choose. But let's make a new kind of plot with some different variables, and we'll just keep it all with black this time, um, just to make it a little more readable for everybody. This this itself isn't really a great looking plot. I'm just trying to show what you can do here. So let's plot th this time. Let's plot fat against. Let's see, fat against sugar. So now we have on our x-axis fat, y-axis sugar. So first we're going to replot this with an x, x lab being fat, y lab being sugar, and the main being just fat versus sugar. Uh, I'm going to personally do PCH equals 16. This is much less important than, than the rest of the stuff. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I, I forgot to put quotes around the labels. They do need, they, these need to be character objects, so you need the quotes around them. There we go. This is our new plot. Now we're going to do an AB line where the vertical line is for the mean of fat. We're just going to keep it black. So um, we're going to now need the, the mean seems to be just below um, one. We must have a lot of points at a couple of duplicate points at zero. What I'm guessing is happening here is you might have a lot of cereals inside this one point here where they're both zero sugar, zero fat. There may be just kind of duplicates here. Um, obviously, if you're just counting up the points, there's more to the right here, but there's also not 43 total points. So there's going to be some duplicate somewhere. This is going to, this should be the true mean of fat though. So I trust this line. Now we're also going to do H equals mean cereal dollar sugar. And there we go. We've now added some lines to look at the distribution of the mean. You have some extreme cereals up here where they're both higher than the average sugar and fat. Um, largely you have a lot of cereals that are high in sugar but um, and high in fat as well sorry this is this is lower than average fat um, but higher in sugar this is where a lot of cereals seem to be um, at least that have unique values this, this is where we see a lot of points at least um, but I, I do suspect that we'll, we're seeing a lot of duplicates especially around this zero point so that covers a, a plotting in R just a basic R this is not using any sort of package like uh, G, the ggplot package. This is just the base R plotting. Uh, in the at the end of the lecture notes, I have a link just to show some more parameters uh, that you can pass to your plot function. There's a lot of things you can tweak about these if you need to get really picky. If you're working on some sort of project that involves that needs nice plots, there's a lot you can do to make plots look really really good in R. It's fantastic for graphics. Um, but there's there's just too many to go over for a video. These these that I showed should be most what you need for uh, stat two eleven.